Kerry Met, virtual traveller, and welcome back to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that explores folklore and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I am an author and professional storyteller. Today, I'm looking at the folklore that can be found in the stories of the Selkie people. The story from law for this episode is actually two stories that I have combined to create one narrative, and it uses the stories of the Selkie and the seal catcher and the fisherman's wife. Selkies are a popular figure in folklore, but for those not familiar with these magical beings, they are sea-dwelling seal folk. Seals in the water and bear typic human beings on the land, once they shed their skin, their beauty is renowned and it is easy for an unsuspecting fisherman to fall in love with one. But unlike mermaids, this is often to the Selkies' detriment, not the humans. Selkie stories typically involve female Selkies, but Selkie men and children also exist, and I'll be talking about those a little later on. Once the Selkie has shed their skin, they love nothing better than to dance and sing on the shoreline, although their song is often described as haunting and mournful. Some believe they only shed their skin at particular times of year, for example, Midsummer's Eve or every ninth night. But one thing is consistent in these tales. Take a selkie seal skin and they cannot return to the water. Originating in Orkney, selkie is Orcadian for seal. However, selkies or seal people also appear in Irish, Scottish, Scandinavian, Sami and Inuit folklore. There are two origin stories involving the Selkies, one that they are angels cast out of heaven for a minor sin which does not warrant them being sent to hell, so a little like the hidden folk of Scandinavia in this respect. The second hypothesis on their origin is that they're the souls of drowned folk. The Selkie and Finn folk mythologies perhaps came here with the Norse settlers or the Sami folk. The Sami would often travel in boats covered in skins, These were often seal skins, and they would travel down the Arctic ice flows. As they went, the boats would gradually fill with water, so occasionally they would have to land the boat and dry it out. With the weight of the water in the boat, the boat would have been partially submerged at this point, and so as they came up onto the beach, it would perhaps have looked like the Sami in the boat were the seals emerging from the water. This myth was further solidified by the fact that they would have to remove their cloaks that were made of seal skins to dry on the ground. As these people were not known in the land that they had travelled to, they may well have appeared ethereal and unearthly, hence the myth of the Selkie people. Often in stories, a Selkie woman is held captive because a human man has her skin. So if the Selkie women often find themselves falling prey to the lustful ways of human men, What of the Selkie men? Well, they're not so innocent themselves. Selkie men will hang around a wedding party of a newly married bride and try to steal her away. To prevent this, it's the tradition to have two people walking around the house where the wedding party is, to act as guards and to warn the groom should a Selkie man approach. But the groom must do his bit too to protect his bride. He must keep his right arm around her shoulders with his hand resting on her heart and kiss her every now and then. Selkie men, like mermen, prefer human brides. And, well, these brides are not always unwilling. In some legends, women even sort them out. But if a human woman wishes to entice a selkie man to the shore, well, she must perform a very specific ritual. She must go to the edge of the sea and cry seven tears into it, whereupon a handsome selkie man will appear and seek unlawful love. So what are the children that are a product of these unions? Selkie children were frequent enough for there to be well-established ways to spot them. Webbed hands and feet that no matter how well cut will grow back and eventually become calluses. On the Orkney Jar website, which, if you haven't had a look at it, has a wealth of information on Orkney folklore, has records of these webbed hands and feet being a very real phenomenon which once occurred on Orkney. These people claim to be descendants of Selkies. Their hands are calloused and can crack, and if they do, they're supposed to give off a a fishy smell. 
Once a selkie has returned to the sea after being captive on land, they can never then return to land. And they will run away at the first chance they get. While selkie women can do little when their skin has been taken, once their skin has been returned, while well, they are well known to take their revenge, for hell hath no fury like a selkie wronged. There are some examples of this in folklore records. There was a farmer on the Isle of Holmes or Eyre who put sheep out to graze on some land near the sea. While he was there, he killed a seal pup, presumably for the meat and the soft skin. The selkie people saw what he did and in the morning he found that all his sheep were gone. Perhaps not an uncommon phenomenon in a landscape which is quite unforgiving. However, this was in the summer and the weather was good, so his sheep should not have been swept away by the sea or even wandered off into the sea because of mists. So perhaps it was the Selkie people. In the Faroe Isles, there's a story of Copaconan. This tells of a Selkie whose skin is stolen. She has a Selkie family and so, of course, wishes to return to the sea as soon as she can. And she does indeed retrieve her skin the first chance she gets, but she has to leave her human children behind and she is seen visiting these children on the beach each day. A few years later, her human husband and some other men, well, they plan to go seal catching. The selkie woman appears to him in his dream and begs him not to kill her husband and her seal children. But he does not heed her warnings. And he does kill both her husband and her children. She seeks her revenge and returns to place a curse on the island, saying that many men will die at sea, and some will even fall off cliffs. Still to this day, there are deaths like that that occur on this island. Perhaps a way of explaining away these terrible tragedies. I've only briefly touched on the folklore of the Selkie folk. There is much of it. But for now, I'd like to tell you a story of the Selkie people. And I have merged two stories into one narrative. These are the Selkie and the seal catcher, and the Selkie and the fisherman. Come with me across the oceans to a tiny island. Here many people had once lived, or at least as many as an island could hold of that size. But now the resources were few and the fishing was scarce. And so there was only one fisherman left on the island. His was a lonely life and he longed to share it with someone. But where would you find a woman that wanted to share such a life? He goes out to sea every day and catches what fish he can, herring, mackerel, sea bass if he's lucky, and then he sells them on to the mainland. The ferry comes each day to collect the catch and at the end of each day the fisherman returns to his croft. He sits by the fire loaded with peats and he takes a dram of whiskey and remembers better times. Times when he would sit by the fire and his father would tell him a story. And this, this is the story his father used to tell him. His father was a seal catcher. He would hunt seals, skin them and sell the furs and the meat. It made him a very good living. One day his father was hunting the seals on the east beach. He had gone out very early in the morning and had watched the seals haul themselves up onto the rocks and as he watched he saw an enormous bull seal sunning itself in the morning sun. He knew its pelt would fetch a fine price and so crawling on his belly he pulled himself closer to where the seal lay. And when he got close enough, he took out his bone-handled hunting knife and plunged it deep into the seal's side. But the seal was big and strong and rose up and roared at him, throwing itself back into the sea as the waves crashed onto the beach. The seal disappeared under the waves along with the seal catcher's knife. That's it, thought the seal catcher. That's my livelihood gone. No longer can I hunt seals. As always, he did try to make the best of it and he headed home on the lookout for perhaps a piece of animal bone or antler with which to make a new knife. As he was walking home, a man on a horse appeared on the path in front of him. It was a stranger. He seemed to have come from nowhere and the seal catcher was confused because, as I said before, this is quite a remote island, even in the seal catcher's time. And there were no people on that island that he did not know. Hi there, he says. 
Have you come with the ferry? No, says the man. I seek the seal catcher of this island. Well, then you have found him. Good. I need twenty furs by this evening, the man on the horse replies. Well, this, this is the deal of a lifetime for the seal catcher. And out of habit, he reaches for his knife. But alas, he says, I do not have my knife. And this is an impossible task without my knife. Have no fear, the man on the horse says. I will take you to where there are many seals that do not need a knife to be caught. Ho oh, ho, since the seal catcher, this sounds too good to be true. And, and so he goes with the stranger who takes him to the west beach, where they stand on the cliff and look down at the beach below. This is not a beach the seal catcher has hunted before, but as he looks down at the seals, he thinks they don't really look that much different to the ones on the east beach. There were indeed many seals below, but he couldn't see how they could be caught either. And as he was about to say this, the stranger pushes him off the cliff and into the water. Down, 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 he falls through the salty water, the waves pushing him under over and over again, and the seal catcher feels he must surely drown. This is the end for the seal catcher, as he falls deeper and deeper through the water. And it is then that he sees behind him a seal swimming. And when he looks into the eyes of that seal, he recognises them as those of the stranger that was on the cliff. He looks at himself too and he sees that he too has changed. He now has flippers and he finds he can hold his breath in the water with ease. Soon he finds himself in a city full of seal people, selkie men and women. And they go into a grand hall and he finds that he can talk to the seals and he speaks their language. They offer him food and drink and he takes it gladly, thinking this must surely be a dream. As he eats, they tell him the story of how one of their seal brothers is injured. He listens to the story with sympathy. But when they ask him for help, he does not see how he can help. Come with us, they say, and they take him to a room where the injured seal lies. When he sees the seal, he recognises the hunting knife stuck in the seal's side and he falls to his knees, sobbing and begging forgiveness for he sees what he has done to this seal and his people. The other selkies hurry around him and hug him with their flippers and nuzzle him with their soft noses against his skin to dry his tears. And they say, you do not need forgiveness. You knew not what you did, but you know now. Now we ask that you give us your love and respect, and if you remove the knife, the injury will heal itself. For it was you that put it there, and it is you that can heal it. And so the seal catcher removes the knife, and the wound does indeed heal as if it was never there. He rejoices and celebrates with the seal people, who then guide him up to the ocean's surface once more, where he then travels home to his wife and son. He tells his son of this story and he tells him that this, this is why, from now on, we do not catch seals. We will be fishermen of this island and we will only take what we need. Well, as I said, it is now that this fisherman, once the son of a seal catcher, looks into the fire and he is remembering this story. And he thinks of those sulky men and women and how they offered his father love and kindness, comfort and companionship, and how he is the last of the fishermen on that isle. For he has no wife and he has no children. And it is as the fisherman is looking into the fire that he gets to thinking that maybe he should go and find one of these selky people that offered his father this love and respect. And so it is that he makes up his mind that the next day he's going to go down to the west beach where he knows the selky folk are. And he gets up early in the morning and he sets off. He goes down to that beach just as the sun is rising. 
his hazy corona hanging on the horizon, oozing pinks and oranges, purples and yellows into the morning sea. He walks down onto the beach and lies down so that he is hiding behind the dunes and he waits. He waits for the selkies. He does not have to wait long, for soon a group of seals come up and onto the beach. They shed their skins and leave them on the rocks so that they may dance and sing in the morning sun. They are the most beautiful, handsome humans he has ever seen. Ethereal, magical, beatific, the fisherman is transfixed. These, these are the sulky people. The fisherman sees a selkie woman whose smile lights up the beach and he decides that she, she will be his wife. He is overcome with lust and the need to be with her and he knows from the stories he has been told that if he takes her skin, she cannot return to the sea. And so he crawls slowly from behind the dunes until he gets to the rock where her skin lies and he carefully reaches out and pulls the skin towards him. None of the selkies see. He runs home and hides the skin beneath the floorboards before returning once more to the beach to claim his prize. He waits until the selkies sing and dance no more and begin to return to the sea. He watches one by one as each one of the selkies finds their skin, transforms and swims away. All that is, except one. And that is the selkie woman he has chosen to be his wife. She stands on the beach, confused, afraid. She cannot find her skin. And it is then that she sees the fisherman watching. And she knows. She knows he has the skin. And so she looks him in the eye and she sings the selkie song. Selkie woman, here I stand, return the skin to me. I was never meant to stay on land, I must return to the sea. The fisherman hears the sorrow in her song, but he does not care. You can sing to me as much as you like, but you will come home with me and you will be my wife. You will keep house for me, you will keep me company, you will comfort me, and we will love and respect each other. Well, of course, this was no way to start a marriage based on love and respect. And the silky woman knew that, but the fisherman, well, he was blind to it. What else could the silky do? She had no choice. He had her skin. And so she returned with him, hoping that maybe she would be able to find her skin one day and escape. The days rolled on, the months rolled on, and soon she found herself a good life. She was looked after well, and she kept house, and she did what she was asked, but she was missing something. She was missing her people. It was then that she discovered she was pregnant, and soon the selkie and the fisherman had a family, and she forgot about that ache inside, for she had a son and a daughter, to occupy her. And they made the hole that she had learnt to live around seem a lot smaller. Her children too were selkies, as that's the way it goes. And her selkie children often asked her what was wrong, as they could see the sorrow that dwelt in her heart. Not only that, but their smell was as good as a seal's, and they could smell that they were not like their father. And so they asked the questions, and their mother had to tell them of their family in the sea and her missing skin. She told them of how she sang to him and that their father would not listen and would not return her skin. But mother, they said, we know where your skin is. We have seen father with it. He keeps it under the floorboards. She could not believe it. Show me, she said, and I will take you to your grandparents. You will be reunited with your kin and we will live as selkie people. The children saw the joy in their mother's eyes, and so next time their father went out fishing, they showed her where the skin was, and together they returned to the West Beach. 
She showed her children how to summon their own skins, and together they disappeared into the waves, never to return. When the fisherman got home, he found his house empty once more, and he knew what his heart had always told him, that you cannot keep something that does not wish to be kept. And so that is the story of the Selkie and the fisherman. And so I shall leave you with this. Yes, sometimes you should find seals they sing to you. For they are selfie men and women, and to the sea are true. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. There are so many tales of the sea, and is it any wonder, given the perils it holds for so many? And there are many shape-shifting sea folk. Before I go, I'd just like to tell you about the Shellycoat. Shellycoat hails from the Scottish borders, and the Shellycoat is a boggle, with a horsey laugh. He's mischievous and at times malicious, but if he takes off his coat of shells, he is powerless. So there you go. It's not just the Selkie people that shed their skins. You can find an extended version of this episode featuring a look at the folklore associated with the Finn folk and mermen, plus the Icelandic story entitled Then the Merman Laughed, which gave rise to the phrase Then the Merman Laughed, which is still used in Iceland today, over on my Patreon, Rewild Yourself Through Story. You can also find digital zines and audio stories. And you can find my Patreon by going to www.patreon.com forward slash DD Storyteller. I do hope to see you there as I'd love to tell you another story. A big thank you to all my patrons, without whom this podcast would not be possible. There are other ways that you can support the podcast. And these are leaving a review. These help the stories journey out into the world and to reach new audiences. And telling your friends and sharing the podcast with them. You may notice that season one's shows are being released weekly and that's because these shows were originally aired as live stream shows earlier this year and I've now converted them to audio for the purposes of the podcast. Season two will be launched in the new year and the episodes will then be released monthly. For more stories woven with folklore in the old ways you can also find me on Facebook as DD Storyteller and on Instagram as at DD underscore Storyteller. I also have a Facebook group called Stories from Law and there we share folklore and music and books and chat a little about the podcast. Thank you for listening and I'll see you again soon for more Stories from Law. Toodle pip! <laughs> <laughs>